Okay. We are going to be talking about the toxic stress cycle. Um, I've taught here, and this might date this recording in 20, well, oh my goodness, it's 2021, uh, right at the beginning. Uh, I've taught for 13 years now, over 1,700 students, and um, I gotta say, a lot of them are in toxic stress cycles. In fact, most Americans are. Our lineage, whether we are Native American, African American, Asian American, uh, Hispano American, um, whether we are coming from Northern Europe, Southern or Eastern, it doesn't matter. We all, due to human history, all come from traumatized populations, some more than others, of course. Um, all suffering is suffering, um, and the brain doesn't know whether it's because, oh my God, Becky hated my hair uh, and put gum in it. Or, oh my God, my I watched my father get tased by the cops. Um, the brain can't actually measure <laughs> the severity of those. It just knows that it feels threatened. And this is the story of how that happens. Every human being today in the future and 5,000 years in the past, 10,000 years in the past, 15,000 years of the past and beyond, experienced some degree of trauma. This is the story of how that actually plays out in our everyday lives today. So let's talk about what gets into our brains before they're even fully formed, okay? Prenatal, before birth, the DNA of your lineage, the DNA of your ancestors, basically tips the scales, okay? It puts you closer or further away from certain types of behaviors or certain types of skin color or certain types of uh, mental processing or certain types of running. Um, that's why you see really famous musicians have kids who are usually pretty good at the arts and at creation. That's why you see a lot of people, and it's, it's a lot more complicated than this, let me be very clear. You'll see this lineage of everybody was a doctor, everybody was a teacher, everybody was a this, everybody was a that, everybody was a professional. My father was a certified public accountant. He was in charge of people's taxes and helping them understand where they were spending their money. His dad was a pharmacist, another kind of professional. His brother, my dad's brother, dentist, my other brother, uh, my other uncle, excuse me, he uh, is an insurance salesman. And uh, my aunt, who was born a bit later than the other three, had a very different set of outcomes. And she's she was a great mom, still is. Um, and so... All of this stuff that happens even before you're born, okay, and while you're within your mama, before the love push, it getting kind of gets you going towards certain behaviors. Let's say your mom um, is pregnant with you and she has a really stressful, really stressful pregnancy because, um, I don't know, maybe a global pandemic has made it hard to eat. That existence of her stress and the fact that she didn't get enough calories is going to impact your DNA. It's going to in impact your code inside of your body. And now it's not going to obviously give you a second stomach or a third arm, but it's going to turn certain genes more likely to turn on and turn others more likely to turn off. Okay. Um, basically, if your mom is super, super stressed, prenatal, and at the natal, when you're born and just afterwards, if your mama's re or your caregiver is really stressed out, your brain and your body gets that message that, kid, you've been born into a fight. You better get ready to fight everything that comes at you. And it can influence you that way. So you're, again, the stress levels of your caretakers are based on their ability to provide Maslow's hierarchy, which we talked about last time, to you. If your parents, if your family members cannot provide these when you come out to mama, and just afterwards, that happened to me. My mom fed me, loved me, cleaned me, but she couldn't be there completely present because she was super, super, super sick with um, a disease she had picked up in Mexico from the water. Her body couldn't handle it. And the stress of pregnancy allowed this uh, disease to come back up again. And my mama was loving and caring, did everything right that she could, but she was really sick. And so this one of the things that made my brain a little bit different are those stress levels right when I came out my mama, okay? But luckily, my mama got well, 
and she took care of me very well. I got lucky. Well, when you are conditioned, this doesn't have to be good. It doesn't have to be bad. But as you're being raised as a young kid, right before all the way until you hit puberty, until you hit adolescence, you get language, interactions, interconnections you learn in the world, the society you live in, the emotional world you live in. And you get a bunch of mental tools from your neighbors, your friends, tus primos, everybody in your life is part of forming the little crystal you see on the right. And I call it um, the DCPA, the Dynamic Central Perceptual Axes, or axis, depending on how you look at it. Uh, let's just think of it as a brain crystal. Think of it as all the information in the universe that you're experiencing comes in, bounces around, and comes out as behavior, okay? Your DCPA, your brain crystal, when a teacher repeats something, that's almost always super important. The teachers talking about the DCPA or brain crystal, the set dynamic central perceptual axis. Oh my God, he said it a third time. That means it's important. Make a note of it. Um, <laughs> is basically the center of your sense of self. It's a result of all you've experienced and a result of all your ancestors, all that your ancestors experienced as well. So everything that your great, 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 great grandma experienced was passed down to her children, to her children, to her children, to her children, and it came out as you. So we all have this lineage. It's, again, one of the reasons there's so much toxic stress disorder in the United States. Well, let's see what happens when a stress event, a specific stress event happens. Let's say a car wreck, okay? When a stress event happens, boom, and your, your body senses a threat, you have no ability, zero ability to control the initial response your body has to that stress. You got no choice in the matter. Your body just gonna do what your body gonna do, okay? And you have what's called an initial uh, stress response. Uh, no, you don't turn translucent and blue, although that kind of would be cool. <laughs> People can't suddenly see through you, but all of these systems and many more inside of your body go through chemical and physical changes that prepares your body to deal with the stress, okay? And this happens in a fraction of a second, I believe three tenths of a second, something happens, and you can get actually even faster than that with training, but naturally speaking, you have a brand new event you were not expecting, it takes you about a third of a second to figure out something's wrong. And by the way, when I say you're able to figure out something's wrong, you don't even know it's happened, but your body does, okay? And your body starts to make a judgment. It says, whoa, 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 whoa. Is this acute stress or chronic stress, okay? If it's acute stress, your body temporarily protects you. It sends certain information and chemicals throughout the entire body to try to help you get your immune system going, okay? But chronic stress actually wears your body down and makes your immune system not work. Oh my God, it's so complicated. No worries. But I do repeat myself here, so you might want to write this down. So, um, we do not have a plan in our brain, in our experience, when we experience acute stress. That doesn't mean adorable stress. It means it's an event that's new. So if you've never been in a car wreck before and you get in a car wreck, oh my gosh, your body freaks out. Oh my God, this is new, this is new, this is new. And if you have chronic stress, your body goes, oh no, <sighs> we've seen this so many times before, but no matter what we try, nothing ever changes. And so your body goes through something in between these two extremes most of the time. Your body completely freaks out, or your body's like, uh, again? No, thank you. And again, almost everything happens in between. Now look at the right. The, en uh, the neuroendometabolic stress response. Um, yeah, all of that happens when you have a stress event. <laughs> Yeeks. A stressor happens. That car wreck we talked about, okay. If it's an acute stress, excuse me, that was kind of gross. Um, if you see somebody stressed, all of this is going on in their bodies. Their reproductive organs, their thyroid, pancreas, liver. Um, uh, this has to do with the nervous system a bit. 
it's a little bit more complicated, but your immune system, your microbiome, the bacteria inside of your body go crazy. Your gastrointestinal, your tummy and your poop shoot go crazy. Your central nervous system, your ancillary nervous system, your heart, your adrenal glands, all of this goes crazy. Your hormones, metabolism, detoxification response, inflammation response, neuroaffect response, <coughs> your cardionomic response, all of it goes crazy trying to help you survive the stress. If that's too complicated for you, maybe you can try rem remembering the other words. Um, it's when you have a secondary stress event, your emotional response to the stress is when you first realize something's wrong. Your biopsychosocial or cardiogastrointestinal neuroimmunal and logical system, that's my fun, that's a fun one. Say that three times fast. Or neuroendometabolic system. Um, let's just think of it as our stress response system. Our stress response system, our stress response system. Our stress response system. Okay, uh, I repeated that many times, it's important. Basically, your body goes through a series of measuring techniques, okay? Your body goes, hmm, how much uncertainty do I have? Have I experienced this before? What information is available? How is this similar to what I've had happen before? What can I control? What can I not control? And what's the conflict between my safety needs, my physiological needs, my belonging needs? And your body goes and it measures all of this. Again, within a second, it does all of this. And you start to have your emotional response. And so your body basically freaks out. <laughs> and your body has to say, okay, I freaked out. Something's wrong. Is this really a threat? Well, <laughs> If your body doesn't think it's a threat, your body's still like, oh, okay, I'm gonna still pay attention. I'm gonna put attention, as my mi abuelo would say. I'm gonna pay attention just in case, but I don't think I'm in a threatening situation. Okay, that's good. Because you can start to come down from that. But what if it is really a threat? What if there really is something that is starting to be a threat to your continued sense of self? Your social self? your psychological self, your mental self, your physical self, your biopsychosocial sexual self, all of these things that make us human, okay? If that gets threatened, we have a stress response. And it's not always a bad thing. It can be a good thing. It's like, well, hello, stranger. Mm, you're attractive. Hello. That can actually cause a stress response too. Uh, and that's the fourth F in fight, flight, or freeze. The fourth one, which in, is engaged through <laughs> romance, if you will, uh, uh, relationships, is fornication. If you thought it was another F word, you're probably pretty reasonable. We will use the word fornication. Uh, you were not put together, by the way, at a Valero. Keep that in mind. So, if your body thinks there is a threat response, or your body's agitated, your sense of self is being threatened, or you have an opportunity to survive, adapt, and reproduce, you go into fight, flight, or freeze mode. And again, if you're safe, generally, uh, fornication mode will happen eventually uh, for most people. Not everybody, but <laughs> in the vast majority of people. So, fight, flight, freeze. What happens next? Well, you have a physical response first, a social search, and a mental reset or retreat. Yes, fight, flight, and freeze are basically the same thing, just through different lenses, through different windows we look through. Think them as, well, maybe like red, yellow, and blue tinted sunglasses. The world will look a little bit different through each of those lenses. So if you decide to fight, your body gets ready to fight. Flight, your brain is telling you to get away from the situation and find allies. And three is when you can mentally reset or retreat. Um, sad story alert. So maybe a trigger, I don't know. Um, I had a young lady who um, was sexually harassed by one of her uh, fellow students. And he touched her in such a way that reminded her of something that happened in her family. Something very traumatic. She asked to use the restroom. And a few minutes later, uh, a girl came into my classroom. The bathroom was right outside of my classroom. And said, there's a girl that's asleep in the bathroom. Well, it turns out this girl was triggered um, to something, again, horrible that had happened to her as a child. And she couldn't escape because she knew it was at, she was at school. 
I let her use the restroom, but that wasn't enough. Her, she was having a traumatic experience. She shut down. She shut down so bad we couldn't wake her up. The only thing that did, and she wasn't on drugs. Let me be very clear. She wasn't on drugs, but the thing that got her out of being in basically a tiny coma, they gave her the same drug they give to people who have overdoses on um, opiates, opium, heroin, okay? And she woke up. It turns out her brain shut her body down so hardcore we couldn't wake her up. And only a drug that is supposed to wake you up was able to do it. <laughs> and she did. She she was not high. She had no drugs in her system. That's how bad her trauma was. And so she had internalized that trauma, and it came out over time uh, that we learned uh, the teachers and the healthcare people from our dis school district. Uh, found out that she had internalized a lot of these things that had happened to her, and we got her the help she needed. But when you internalize the threat because you and your allies can't express emotion or you can't change the situation, you start to basically get into that nasty cycle. If you externalize in a healthy way, if you externalize the threat by expressing your emotion and you're able to attempt change in a way that doesn't cause more stress, you start to escape the cycle, okay? You start to recover because you took action. So what happens on the internalization side? Well, you internalize too much, you become habituated. You adapt by temporarily accepting the increasing destabilization of your life. And if you keep that going, you get maladaptive normalization and you permanently accept the increasing destabilization of your life and pass this sensibility down the generations to other people you meet, to your own children, to their children. Our goal in this class and in life is to externalize the things that have happened to us, to express the emotions and attempt to change the way things are. Ladies and gentlemen, I don't have to tell anybody listening to this, anybody watching this, there's a lot of pain in this world and it doesn't have to be this way. I'm telling you, it doesn't have to be this way. Somebody, a group of somebodies, and it's a very complicated group of somebodies. It's, it's much larger than a bunch of people sitting in a room somewhere, okay? Let's be very clear. There's not a conspiracy theory when where 30, 40 people run the world. It's more like 400, but uh, <laughs> we all run the world. And because we all accepted, we all have adapted to the maladapted, to the normalization of uh, injustice and racism and sexism and hate and heteronormativity and all of these things that we think are normal. We've accepted certain things as normal and it's, eh, the universe likes diversity, not unanimity. It likes things to be diverse. And so once we externalize our threats, once we express our emotions and attempt change, we can start to understand and then influence and in the best cases, we can change our circumstances, either individually, as a family, as a community, or maybe as classmates, okay? And once we start to learn because we expressed our emotion and attempted change, we will learn that we are not alone in our pain. We are not the first people to feel these things. We're not the first people to think these things, but we're gonna be the first people to move things towards a better term, to move the world to something more beautiful and, mo and, and more green and lush and life-filled. We can do that, but we first have to externalize our emotions and attempt the change in the first place. Once we've learned how to do that, we start to adapt and we start to see healthiness is the best way to go forward. We learn to interrupt, control, or lessen the threats to our continued senses of self. Now, you can see the two cycles here on one screen. We're all born from pre-existing cycles, damage to our DNA, structures built from our parents' DNA, and then we're born. We're conditioned, we get through life and then have the stress events happen. Everybody has a stress-free life. The only stress-free are the dead. Their stress is multiplied into the people that love them. Yeah, that's kind of deep. Huh. Anyway, so you have a stress response and you either ex are able to express it and start to understand your stress, 
or you repress it and accept it. And you just start going back into the same cycles. Um, you know, that's why um, I had a, a high school student once who got really, really, really mad at me. And that student, I <laughs> this is hard to believe, that student was caught out after I made him a little bit angry. Just, and it was not very angry. It was something pretty small. Uh, I was like, dude, come on. I, I need to get through this lesson. Well, that was enough to trigger this kid. He went outside of my classroom and peed on my, on my, on my portable. <laughs> That's what a little five-year-old does. Why was he doing that? Did I get mad at him? Did I write him up? No, I got the hose and I said, hey, what happened to you when you were about five or six? And the kid started crying. So how did you know? I said, well, because a five-year-old or a six-year-old would pee on the building to get back at the person he was mad at. So you acted like a five-year-old, so I asked what happened when you were five, buddy. And we got him the help he needed. <laughs> I, I just love this. We can break the toxic stress cycle, but we have to do it by expressing ourselves and understanding ourselves so that we can learn and evolve and overcome our traumas. So that seems a lot more complicated than just people are good and people are bad. Well, maybe, maybe it's overwhelming, but here's the good news. Our brains are built to make these choices. We can either repeat the past or learn to evolve. I don't know about you. I like the second one. I'd prefer to learn to evolve rather than repeat the past again and again and again, like a hamster running on a wheel. Your next task is going to be up to your teacher. With all of that in mind about the toxic stress cycle, let's look at the stress in our lives or in other people's lives and how it's going to help us understand how to adapt, survive, and reproduce in the future.